Okay, um, let's go ahead and uh, start the meeting. It's 1115, so thank you all again. Um, really quickly, uh, if you wouldn't mind, there's a participants panel or, or the chat, either way works. If you could just give me a quick thumbs up that uh, you can see my screen, uh, that you can see the creating accessible documents um, slide. Hopefully uh, that's, uh, okay, fantastic. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much. So just a, a few housekeeping things. Um, if you've been attending the presentations, you probably know that there is a closed caption uh, option today. So at the very bottom of your screen, uh, you will find, or actually it might be at the top uh, since I'm sharing my screen, but there is a, a closed caption uh, button. If you click that, you can actually display uh, captions as I'm speaking. So just wanted to mention that really quickly. But yeah, thank you so much for, for joining me. Uh, welcome to the presentation. My name is Julie Allen. Um, I'm an instructional designer with ASU Library. And before that, I worked with Ed Plus for four years. Um, and so I'm really excited to, to join you to talk about uh, creating accessible documents with Microsoft Word. So just uh, again, maybe by chat or if uh, under the participants menu, if you wanna uh, raise your hand and just let me know um, how many of you use Microsoft Word, um, you know, as part of your as part of your job function. All right, yeah, I'm seeing some hands pop up. Cool, and seeing some stuff pop in the chat. Awesome. Okay, yeah, um, good, because you know that that was kind of the discussion, um, you know, in the planning committee, you know, talking about the different tools that that we all use. And Microsoft Word, I think, is a pretty common one. It's one we all use. Um, maybe we're creating documents for, for students or for our learners, maybe syllabi or, or worksheets. I think it's also pretty common to create, uh, you know, handouts and documents for, for colleagues. So I think a pretty common tool that a lot of us use. Um, so we felt this was kind of like a high impact topic that we, we could talk about. And, uh, and I also wanted to mention um, there is going to be, you know, some overlap if any of you attended the, uh, the Ally training today or attended the, uh, the Creating Accessible presentation. Uh, presentation. Um, but a lot of the things that I'm gonna talk about actually do kind of uh, transition over to PowerPoint. They're, they are different, but uh, because it's a Microsoft tool, there is definitely some crossover. So just wanted to mention that as well. So let's move on really quickly. Uh, of course, because I'm an instructional designer, I have to have objectives. So, um, but really, I, I want to let you all know, like, essentially what you can expect to hopefully walk away with at the end of this presentation. So you'll know if this is a good use of your time. Um, but so by the end of the session, I'm, you know, the plan is that you'll be able to recognize common issues that can make content in Microsoft Word documents inaccessible to folks who use visual and uh, or who have visual and cognitive impairments and apply tools and strategies within Microsoft Word to remediate those to remediate those issues. So, um, you know, a pretty, pretty common question when I, uh, you know, kind of talk with faculty about this topic or, or talk with other folks do presentations on this topic is kind of, um, you know, how can I tell my Microsoft Word document is accessible because obviously, um, you know, if it's something that you've already created, you know, it's, it's, is it a good use of my time? Do I need to worry about going back and, and making it accessible? So, you know, how, how can I tell if my document is accessible? So we have a couple great tools uh, at ASU. So those of you who are familiar or who use Canvas are probably, and again, if you attended the presentation this morning on Ally, you'll be familiar with this. But we have a great tool that's uh, integrated into Canvas called Ally, and it is a tool that checks the accessibility of uh, things that have been uploaded to the learning management system. So things like PDFs and, and Word documents and, and files and these kinds of things. So anything that's up uploaded to the file section um, when you go into Canvas, you will see in, from the files menu, anything that you've uploaded, you're going to see an accessibility, uh, accessibility section. And then from there, there's, a, uh, there are dials that will show up. So, um, a green dial basically means like, it's good, it's accessible. Um, a yellow dial means, you know, it, it's okay, but it, it needs some work. And then red means there are some fundamental issues that would prevent somebody from using assistive technology from, you know, accessing and opening the document. So, um, you know, if this is something you've already created, you've already created a Word document, you can upload it to Canvas if you want to go ahead and let Ally do that quick check. Another thing that I like to mention, and I will be going over this in the demo, uh, is that uh, all the Microsoft products uh, as part of the office suite have an accessibility checker built right in which is awesome i use it all the time and i catch stuff that i miss all the time using it which is fantastic but 
from the again I'll, I'll go over this but from the review menu within uh within microsoft word you will find a check accessibility uh tool that will actually run through your document and will flag anything that is uh, a problem or problematic and it will actually give you step-by-step -step directions for remediating which is awesome so two great tools for just kind of doing a quick uh, temperature check making sure that your document is accessible um, so moving on from there, I know that this can seem really overwhelming, um, you know, especially if you've created a lot of documents or maybe you have a longer document, a complicated document. It can maybe sometimes seem, you know, really overwhelming, um, you know, where do I start, right? Um, so I just wanted to give you a, a quick list of, I think, some of the good places to start, right, especially if this is something that's new to you. So don't feel like you have to go in and, and you know, completely recreate your document. Um, you know, just start, maybe start with a couple of things on this list and, and then, you know, you can make improvements as you go. Um, and, and this list certainly isn't completely all inclusive, but um, I think these are some really high impact things that you can do to make sure that your documents are accessible. And um, so, and we are going to be going over these today during the presentation. So the first is to use heading styles because what that does is it creates a hierarchy of information. So if you think about somebody opening a document um, and kind of, uh, you know, kind of like what is a subheading of what, right? You know, this is a subheading of this subheader. It, it kind of creates that structure so folks can, who are using assistive technology can kind of understand, um, again, the hierarchy of information. So heading styles is really important. It's also important because folks who use um, screen readers and other assistive technology can actually pull up essentially a table of contents using heading styles. And so again, if you're thinking about maybe a, a longer document or a more complex document, especially something that if students need to go back to it multiple times to reference information. If you think about a screen reader, because a screen reader does basically just, uh, you know, it reads the content in a document um, as long as it's been appropriately tagged. Um, if it's something, let's say maybe it's five pages in and, and they're thinking, okay, I know they covered this talk, this document without using the heading styles and the tagging, they would have to start at the very top and then you know, read everything from the top to page five in order to find that information again. Um, but if you've used heading styles, they can just kind of quickly jump to that, back to that section. So it, it makes it a lot more uh, user-friendly, which is I think really important. Um, adding alt text to images. So images are just kind of fundamentally inaccessible to a screen reader. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're describing the, the image to somebody who, who can't see it. So alt text is really important, especially if your images contain content. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, choosing color carefully, simplifying your table structure. Um, again, we'll, we'll delve into that. Writing effective link text and using white space. All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to transition into my document. Let me go ahead really quickly and then the chat just for anybody who joined um, later. If you want to follow along, I'm going to post. Um, I put the document in Dropbox. So if you want to open it up and follow along, please feel free. Um, and uh, if, you know, if not, uh, I'm going to pull it up real quickly here. Hopefully, uh, everybody. Maybe just really quickly in the chat, if you can let me know that you are, uh, that my, my, uh, my Microsoft Word. So Joanne, you should be able to just click that link and it will pull the, the document up. Um, everybody has Dropbox as part of their uh, ASU suite. Um, so everybody, hopefully you can see my, see my document okay. Can, can everybody see the Word documents? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, fantastic. Um, where? Oh, sorry. Can I, uh, somebody have a question? Uh, okay. Um, all right, so let's go really quickly. Uh, well, maybe not quickly, but let's transition into the, the document here. So um, again, let's talk about heading style. So again, as I mentioned earlier, heading styles are important because it does create that hierarchy of information. It, it kind of tells, uh, tells folks essentially like what, what's a, a heading, what's a subheading of what, and, and creates that hierarchy of information. So what you want to do to create heading styles is uh, from your home menu, you're going to see a styles menu here. Um, for, you know, you may have seen this menu before and, and wondered what, what it did. It, it does a couple things actually that I, I think are really helpful. The first is it can be a really quick way if you want to format something uh, and make it look a certain way, like maybe you want to have your 
um, you know, your he heading ones, you want to always be maroon and bold and, and 18 point font. It can be a quick way of just kind of like tagging that instead of having to go in and fix all that stuff manually. Um, but then again, it also does structure the document for a screen reader. So to do that, so here I have, uh, I've typed out heading level one. So to make that he heading level one, all I have to do is go into my styles menu and find heading one. And then if I click that, you'll see it automatically formatted. I, I have my headings set up so that they're 18 point, bold, maroon, and that they have a, a, a nice underline. Um, so what's cool about that is it, it automatically formats that. Uh, so you know anything that I've uh, set as heading level one, like for example, if I wanted this to be a different, uh, let's say I decide I wanna make this blue. I'm gonna go into my uh, my color menu, I'm going to find the blue that I want, or it's kind of, a, I guess, a grayish. And then if I want to make everything gray, what I can do is I can just click into this heading level that I've changed. I can right click my heading one, and I can click update heading one to match selection. So now you'll, if you can uh, see the document, you'll see that uh, where I have part one heading styles, because I've also set this as heading level one, it's going to change everything that I've set as, as heading one to that same formatting. So, you know, if you think about, you know, again, like a longer document, if you have like maybe a 10 page document, you have a bunch of header ones, then you decide later on that, hey, I want to make this gray instead of red. Um, instead of having to go through individually each one and change that font or change that color, if you've used your heading styles, all you have to do is make that change once and it'll automatically apply that throughout your document. So I think it's just like a really nice, uh, really nice tool. Um, I'm gonna undo that because um, I just wanna leave it the way it is. So, so that's my heading level one. So what about um, subheadings? What about heading level two? You'll see here that there is a, a heading two, or there should be a heading two in your document and heading, let's see, heading level three. So again, heading three. Um, if you want to go into your styles menu, there's a uh, little drop down. It's a little uh, drop down icon. Little um, looks like a little box with an, an arrow popping out. Um, it's it's it just styles. And there's also an Alt Control Shift S. Um, and if you can see, it's it's popped up my styles menu, and now I can see all the styles that are enabled in my document. So there's heading four. There's title. There's some, other, um, there's some other styles in here that are automatically built in, but the, the ones to really focus on are the heading, heading one, heading two, heading three, et cetera. Are there any questions about that really quickly before I move on? Oh, I see chat, I see a few people uh, popping up. Okay, um, so let me know if you have any questions about styles before I move on. Okay, and we can always go back if there are any questions. So that's basically headings in a nutshell, pretty easy, I think. Um, and again, like a, just a great feature to be aware of. So the, th the second thing that we wanna talk about is creating alt text for images and smart art and so on. So um, again, you know, folks who uh, are using assistive technology uh, may not be able to see, especially if they're blind or visually impaired, they may not be able to see the document. So they may be using assistive technology like a screen reader. And uh, again, images would be, you know, kind of fundamentally inaccessible. So um, what you can do, especially for a, a, an image that has content. So I have a pie chart here and I, I totally made up the data. This is not real data, but it's uh, favorite ice cream flavors uh, in Arizona, percent of the population. And um, I have 50% like chocolate, 20% like vanilla and 10%, 30% uh, like caramel. There are some issues with this because it's uh, it's color coded, which we can talk about too. Um, if I'd had, I had a little bit more time, what I should have done is also set this to have maybe, um, because you never want to use color alone, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So this is a little bit inherently problematic because we have um, orange is really the only way to note that it's uh, chocolate, right? So there are some things we could do. We could maybe use like a pattern orange and maybe a dot pattern, maybe green, we could have like a line pattern. So, you know, that, it, it, that is something to think about. But um, for this example, what we're kind of thinking about is how would we describe this to somebody who can't see it? So what we want to do is uh, right, again, right click on the image or uh, select the image. And then you'll see an edit alt text uh, option pop up. So now this is where you can describe, um, generally speaking, alt text should be more or less about 140 characters. Um, 
Microsoft Word recommends one to two sentences. That's probably like a pretty good way to kind of judge if you're, you're hitting the 140 character um, limit. And uh, so, you know, uh, something like this, I, I may just say, um, you know, favorite ice cream flavors. And, and uh, yeah, so in alt text, you have this box here. And so I would say, you know, favorite ice cream flavors in Arizona. I won't, uh, ice cream flavors. I am not typing this correctly in AZ, um, but I would maybe say 50% uh, like chocolate, 20% uh, like vanilla, and I apologize for the atrocious spelling. I hate, uh, I hate typing on camera, <laughs> and 30% like caramel or report liking caramel. But basically, what I like to think about is. If I had the student sitting next to me, or if I had the, the user sitting next to me, um, how would I describe the image? Um, and again, going back to the 140 characters, this is like a relatively, it's a, again, it's just a pretty simple pie chart with like three different categories. But I'm sure you can imagine if you had like a really complicated graph, or maybe you had a really complicated data table. Um, data table should really be presented in a, you know, in an actual table as opposed to an image. Um, but let's think about maybe like a like a, a line graph or something like that that had a lot of data points. What you might consider doing is just um, in, in one to two sentences, maybe just saying, um, uh, let's say that this example, let's say I, we had 50 flavors listed. That's a lot of flavors, but let's say we did. Um, we could say, you know, um, graph of favorite ice cream flavors, see, see caption for data. And then below the, below the image, I could maybe put in um, a caption. I could say image caption. And then I could add the information here. I could type it out. Another thing you could do, again, with a really complicated data or a really complicated graph is you might want to give a data table. That's actually for folks who are using assistive technology. That might be the easiest way to easily tab through. So um, maybe in an appendix or below the table, there's a lot of different ways you could handle that. Um, uh, maybe the appendix might be the best way to do it. Um, but you could, again, like provide the actual data table. And that way, um, for somebody who can't see the image, they could actually tab through the data table and, and uh, grab all that information. Another thing um, that I uh, have, have seen in documents uh, is creating um, images basically using uh, uh, word art or um, shapes. So what I did is I created, it's, I've got three boxes here. I've got a box that says item A, and it doesn't really, it's kind of a nonsense image, but uh, I have a box that says item A, and then it's got an arrow pointing to item B, and then below that it's got also got an arrow pointing to item C. And I built this out just using shapes. So this is a box, item A is a box, item B is a box, item C is a box, and then I just use arrows, uh, drew arrows to point to the different boxes. Um, but this would inherently be, because I think a screen reader would essentially just say um, box, arrow, arrow, box, box. Like it wouldn't be able to intuit like what you were um, creating the image that you were creating with this, uh, with this information or with these uh, boxes. So there are a couple things that you'll want to do to make this, uh, again, to provide alt text and to make this usable um, for, for folks who are using uh, screen readers. So the first thing you're going to want to do is group all the items together so that a screen reader would understand like these aren't just separate things kind of floating in space, that these are all part of like one, one specific image. So to do that, I'm going to um, basically, I'm going to select the first box. I'm going to select both the arrows and then I'm going to select the boxes below that. So essentially I'm just selecting um, everything that's part of that image. From there, I'm going to go to format and I'm going to go up to, um, there's a group object tool under the format menu. So I'm going to click the group object. I'm going to click group. And then what, so, um, if you could see the screen, you'd see that uh, basically a box just appeared around all of the items. So basically Word is now recognizing that this is one, one image, one collective image as opposed to a bunch of different things. So now what I can do, let me X out of this. Um, again, I can right click on the image and then I can click this uh, edit alt text. And then again, here I could add my alt text, um, you know, whatever the description would be. Um, I might say, you know, item, item A points to item B and item C, something like that. I'm just gonna put some gobbledygook in there for now. Um, another thing that I should mention as well is that if you had a decorative, this isn't decorative, this actually would, I think, you know, contain some information. 
But if you had an, an image that was purely there for visual interest, it's just there to kind of maybe evoke like an emotional response or it's not really conveying content. It's just there kind of as um, a decorative using things uh, for decoration. That's That could be a whole presentation probably in itself. But let's say that it was an image that really didn't, yeah, it really didn't contain content. It was just there for kind of decorative purposes. I can mark it as decorative here. There's a little box, a little checkbox. This is mark as decorative. If I clicked that, basically it would hide it from the screen reader. Uh, the screen reader wouldn't even be told, wouldn't even tell the user that there was an image there. And kind of the way you're thinking, the way I, uh, somebody put uh, an example, I thought this was a really good example, was a, a dentist's office. Like pretty, pretty often if you go to a website for like a dental office, you'll see like an image of like a smiling family and they have beautiful teeth. And that's really there just to kind of like evoke that emotional response, right? Like, oh, they have such beautiful teeth. I would also like beautiful teeth. I would like to go to this dentist's office and have beautiful teeth like this family. But if you can't see the image, um, I mean, you could put alt text saying, uh, you know, family with bright white teeth, but it's almost like a waste of their time to describe the image because it's kind of like, yeah, eh, okay. Like that doesn't really give me any important information. So that might be an example of something you would want to mark as decorative. And then so going back to my example here with the, the uh, objects or with the, um, with the shapes, the last thing that you'll want to do, because when you use the shape tool, basically it doesn't automatically anchor the images like within your text. So if you think about like I have text and then I have my image and then I have more text, it doesn't necessarily know, like a screen reader wouldn't necessarily know like where to place that within the text. Like sight by sight, I might be able to tell like, okay, it comes like between, between these two pieces of text, but a screen reader wouldn't necessarily understand like where to place it. So what you need to do is actually, um, oops, let me go back. I'm gonna click. And then there is a uh, layout options button that will pop up. Um, and this basically, yeah, tells your, uh, tells it choose how your object interacts with the text around it so um, usually what you want to do is put it in line with text and then that that anchors it so now it understands that it comes uh, below this image caption that it comes uh, below this text so just a couple quick things to talk about with uh, you know uh, with creating uh, images using using shapes uh, any questions about images before we move on to the next topic if you save as a PDF, do these, yeah, that's actually the last thing, Cindy, that's a great point. That's the last thing I will talk about because um, there are a few things that you have to do, but yes, you can export this to a PDF. Um, there's a specific way to do it though. If you print as a PDF, it's basically gonna um, create an image only PDF, which uh, will strip all the accessibility features. So I'll show you really quickly, you know, how to do that at the very end, because yeah, that's really important. And I know a lot of folks do provide their documents as a, uh, yeah, as PDFs. So, um, so part three is choosing color carefully. So um, let's see, here I have an example for those of you who can't see it. It says um, some color combinations are really hard to read. Um, and I have really in a light blue text on a white background. Uh, so you can barely see it. Um, and hard, the word hard, I have black text and a dark green background. So again, just really hard to see. And read is a light green text on a bright green background. It's it's this is all just yeah really really tough to read. So but I this is an, obviously a very extreme example, but I think it kind of shows like sometimes color contrast can be an issue, especially if you have um, low vision. And I notice that the older I get, the more trouble I even with my glasses on, the the harder time I have reading things. I have to squint a lot. So um, so uh, you know color contrast can be really really important to to note. Um, WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and I, I, I just kind of mentioned this offhand, you don't have to memorize this ratio, but um, WCAG recommends a color contrast of at least 4.5 to 1 for normal text and 3 to 1 for large text. What does that mean? Um, more or less, it just basically means, uh, you know, do, a, do a, a dark font on a, on a light background or vice versa, a light font on a really dark background. If you wanted to actually check the color contrast, uh, WebAIM, which is a, just a fantastic resource for web accessibility anyway, but that's W-E-B-A-I-M, WebAIM. So they have a color contrast uh, checker. Let's see if I can open this up really quick. Open the hyperlink. So, um, ah, here we go. Yeah, so they have a color contrast checker. If you wanted to put in your foreground and background colors, um, it'll actually give you the contrast ratio. 
and then it will tell you whether or not it passes. So, you know, I'm just gonna, there's a little slider here. So you can see as I make the foreground color lighter, it starts to fail, um, uh, white, white text on a light foreground color, it fails. And then you can slide and then what's nice about this too is once you it passes you could grab this foreground color and paste that into your word document so um, again web aim color contrast checker is super helpful um, for uh, for the purposes of wcag they consider large text to be 18 point font and small text is anything smaller in, in case you're curious about what that means um, but again, just kind of thinking about, um, you know, not using color alone. Uh, here I have a, an example of a study guide, and it basically says the correct, it's uh, multiple choice questions, and it says the correct response is indicated in green. So I, the first question is, who is the ASU mascot? And then we have Sparky, Billiken, and Otto the Orange. Um, hopefully I pronounced that correctly. And then Sparky, the only thing I did to denote that it was the correct response is I put, I, I made that font green. So you can imagine if you are colorblind, this would really not be very useful. Um, you you might not be able to distinguish that the green, maybe you would, but um, it might be kind of hard to tell that that's, that's correct. Um, and again, if you have a screen reader, if you're using a screen reader, the screen reader is not going to denote that it's green font. So this would be pretty uh, just fundamentally accessible. So one thing that we could do here is next to Sparky as it, again kind of like you can use that's not to say that you can't use color coding because color coding can be really helpful if you if you're cited but it's just kind of you want to think about also a secondary way of denoting uh, whatever the information is um, so next to Sparky I could put correct in parentheses and that would be kind of like my secondary way so if you um, can see colors you can distinguish the colors like you can see that green it can easily point out you know uh, quickly point out what's correct, but then I also have correct in parentheses. So it's kind of just always thinking about like that secondary way of, of you know, denoting information. Um, again, going back to that pie graph example, the pie chart. So um, you might think about using patterns in addition to color. So you can use color to denote, but it's just always giving that secondary way. So if I'm colorblind, I could maybe distinguish that the patterns are different. Okay, so um, that's uh, basically color contrast. Are there any uh, questions about color contrast before I move on to table structure? Okay, um, again, just let me know if there are any questions. Um, so then part four, let's talk about really quickly about table structure and column headers. So um, Microsoft Word is pretty simple. I mean, different, different programs handle tables differently. Um, um, in, in PDF and Adobe Acrobat, there's kind of like more more ways you can kind of delineate um, a table structure. Microsoft is pretty simple. It's basically, it'll just read a table um, uh, left to right, top to bottom. And so if you have, um, and this isn't to say that it's a, you know, a totally black and white issue. Like there are certainly times when you might have split columns, you might have um, uh, table cells that are split or spanned. But generally speaking, in Microsoft Word, if you can simplify the table structure, that's what you would you you want to do. You basically, um, it, so I have an example here of a. Uh, it's supposed to be kind of like a course schedule. It's a week one uh, topic, and then I have underneath that I have some um, split or some some um, rows that I've split into columns. So uh, you know, essay one, 30 points, and then the due date. So the problem with this, though, is that, again, um, a screen reader would read week one topic and then it would have, you would have these, uh, you know, it, it, it denotes that, you, uh, you know, there are different cells and it, it wouldn't necessarily understand if this makes sense that like this row is kind of spanning above all the columns, like it wouldn't necessarily be able to intuit that this is a header for these, these um, columns or these uh, cells below if that makes sense. So um, a better way to split this example into a, a readable table structure would actually be to use headers. So I've broken, instead of having, um, I'm gonna open up the layout um, or actually uh, design, no, excuse me, layout. So um, you can, if you can see under the layout, there's split cells and split table and, and merge cells. Um, you kind of want to avoid those if at all possible. So underneath, instead of having a uh, week one is essentially like a, a, a spanned column, I have a uh, week one topic as a header. So again, going back to my header styles, I've set this as header three because I, I have a header two here. So uh, header, and then I have a more simplified. So I have uh, assignment title, 
is now a, a header row. Point value is a header row for my uh, my points. And so it's just, it's a very simplified, just, um, just you know, no, no split or span, just uh, individual, uh, individual columns for, and you always, as a general rule as well, want to have something, um, something that denotes what's going to um, be presented in that column. So basically a column header, you always want to have a column header. So I've, I've used here assignment title as a column header, and then my assignment titles underneath that. Point value is my header for my point value here, and then due date um, is my header for um, for my actual due dates. So uh, I know that's kind of a complicated topic to cover. And again, you may have um, you know you may have data charts, you may have things where you you do need to use um, split and span columns. So again, nothing's ever 100% black and white. You can also um, add uh, alt text to your uh, under table properties, I believe. Oh yes, uh, alt text. This isn't a requirement, but um, you can uh, provide alt text uh, if you wanna provide some additional or maybe just like a quick description of a table that might tell a student um, you know, that they, uh, they could skip a table if they didn't wanna read through it. It just gives them a general description of what's gonna be contained in the table. That can also kind of help like anchor, uh, anchor them to what's gonna be uh, presented in the table. But again, just thinking about like a screen reader always reading things uh, left to right, top to bottom. So simplifying that table structure is helpful. So uh, let's move on really quickly because uh, we are getting close to time here and I wanna make sure we have time for, for questions. Um, I think this was also mentioned, I know it was mentioned in the uh, presentation, uh, the creating accessible presentation um, presentation this morning. Uh, it was probably covered in Ally too, but um, you want to use link text or write effective link text. So um, when you have something that says, uh, the example here is click here to access information on writing effective link text. And then here is what I've linked. Um, and this is a link out to a WebAIM article. Um, this is problematic because uh, when somebody's using a screen reader, um, there's a way that they can pull up like essentially a menu of links. And it, again, it can be a quick way of kind of like moving through a document, especially if they maybe want to go back and reference a link or they wanted to, again, like um, go back to a document and like, I know there was a link in there somewhere for a web name article that I wanted to check out. Um, so I'm sure you can imagine if they've, uh, if you've done that kind of consistently through your document, like click here, it would just be like here, 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 right? It, and, and they wouldn't really understand like what, what am I gonna get when I click this link? Um, so what you, what you would, what you can do instead of, of deep linking something like here is that you can rewrite the, rewrite your sentence. Um, and basically what you want to do is you want to deep link the descriptive text. So if you're thinking about a sentence and, and thinking about where you want to put the hyperlink, it's kind of thinking about, okay, what text in this sentence would kind of describe like what they're going to get if they click the link. So what I've done is I've rewritten, rewritten the above example to be visit WebAIM for tutorial on writing effective link text. And I've deep linked writing effective link text because that essentially kind of tells them, okay, if you click on this link, um, it's gonna cover writing effective link text or it kind of describes like what they're going to go to if they, um, if they click this link. And again, if they were you know, creating an, a, or if they were opening up this document and they were kind of going through the menu of, of hyperlinks, again, it's just kind of like, oh, okay, like I'm gonna get something that's gonna talk about writing effective link text. So, um, and there's no really right or wrong way to, to do this. I mean, the, the general preference is kind of like brevity is good. So kind of just like the shortest amount of text that still makes sense. But um, again, there's no real like right or wrong. It's just more, again, making sure that the link or the text that you're linking is the descriptive or the meaty part of the sentence, if that makes sense. So then let's move on really quickly. Uh, Cause I think uh, when we talk about like using white space effectively, um, this is something that I think really benefits um, everybody. It, it uh, especially if you maybe have somebody who has like ADHD or, or dyslexia or um, you know, maybe different, uh, different types of cognitive impairments. And I, I think just anybody, um, like a big wall of text can be really um, intimidating, um, especially if it's maybe uh, more complicated or perhaps if they're learning, um, learning the language, if, if they're uh, maybe uh, not a native English speaker, it can, just, um, it can just feel very intimidating and overwhelming. 
So without even, so this is, uh, this is some information for, I just pulled from Wikipedia as an example on the French Revolution, but um, if you can see the document, it's just, it's, it's, I think like 20 or 30 lines presented as one paragraph. So there are no, there are no paragraph breaks. It's just a big wall of text. Um, and without going in, without changing any of the text, I mean, really all, all it takes is just going through and maybe, um, I don't know, I, I have a background in journalism. I, I have my bachelor's degrees in journalism. We were always taught it's more or less like every two sentences to break into a new, par new paragraph that might be um, a little bit extreme. Um, so, it, you know, it, it, it totally depends on, on your discipline and then sort of like the level student that you're writing for. Um, so anyway, but I, I usually kind of go back to like two or three sentences, but I mean, all I'm gonna do is just go through this, this uh, text and I'm just gonna add some, I'm just gonna add some paragraph breaks just to, just to break it up a little bit. Um, so for those of you who can see the screen, um, I, hopefully this looks a little less intimidating. Hopefully this looks a little bit uh, cleaner, a little bit easier to read. And, and research really does show that this does help improve reading comprehension. So um, if, if nothing else, going through your documents and kind of just looking for ways to kind of break up that text to add white space, that can be immensely helpful for your students. Uh, so finally, let's talk about the accessibility checker tool because I really, as I mentioned, I think earlier, I just absolutely love this tool. Um, so again, going to review the review uh, menu and then clicking this check accessibility. Um, so it, it's found some things that I have missed. Um, it's finding again, so what it does is it pulls up an inspection results menu and it'll show you everything that it thinks is, uh, is problematic that's gonna cause an issue. And then, uh, so one of the warnings that it's uh, identifying in my document is that I have merged or split cells in table. Um, so if I click this, oops, click the table cell. So it's going to take me right to the spot where I, uh, you know, where I've, I've kind of have the issue. And then it's actually going to tell you why you should fix it. So here it says, you know, tables should have simple structures so that they can be easily navigated and understood by people with disabilities. Uh, merged or split cells can cause unexpected navigation issues. And then it will actually give you the steps to fix it. So, um, you know, to test and simplify the table structure, select the first cell, press the tab key repeatedly to make sure that the focus moves across the rows and then down to the next row. Um, and then, uh, so, uh, you know, and actually, let me really quickly, I'm gonna remove, I'm going to remove the uh, alt text from this image just because I think that's kind of a nice example too. Let me just take that out. And okay, so I've removed, okay, so now it's, it's finding an error missing alternative text, chart six. So here, um, you know, it's giving you the steps to fix and it's gonna tell you exactly again, like how to add the alt text. So, um, you know, right click the outline item, select format. Um, so it's just a nice way, you know, again, cause I would never expect that you will remember all of this. Um, there will be a recording of course and in a handout, but, um, you know, again, uh, it, it can be hard, especially when you're talking about like, something like Word, like where did I go? Where was that menu item? Um, so this is just a great way. It'll, it'll tell you exactly where to click, what to click. It'll give you all the recommendations um, and tell you how to go in and fix it. So that's really nice. And, and then it also pointed out too that I have hard to read uh, text contrast. So that's a, a nice too. It, it will like kind of look for some uh, like color contrast issues and this kind of thing, which is also really nice as well. And then finally, because I know we're coming, coming close on time here, let's talk about uh, converting to a PDF. So again, um, what you wanna do is make sure that you're not, there, there is a way you know you can print as a PDF, so what, but what's, what that is doing is creating an image only PDF, which um, would, we would strip all the accessibility features that you've just spent all this time uh, adding to your document, which would not be great. So, um, so what you wanna do is go to uh, File, uh, Save As, and here, let me just uh, grab my current folder. So, um, so from there, uh, under the save as type, we're gonna find PDF. And then what we are going to do is go to options. And from there, under the options menu, there's going to be a document structure tags for accessibility. You wanna make sure that you have that clicked. 
And that will, once you've clicked that, so that's a, a little radio uh, button option. So again, uh, document structure tags for accessibility, click OK, and then go ahead and uh, save as a PDF. So I would click Save, and it would save that as a fully accessible PDF. And then just really quickly, I will give the caveat that it's not a bad idea to open it up. And um, there's going to be a presentation later on uh, accessible PDFs. Um, you could pull that up in uh, Adobe Acrobat Pro and just give that a quick run through. But uh, if you want to make extra extra certain, or of course, you know, uploading to uh, uploading to Ally, uploading to Canvas and checking the Ally score. But um, if you've checked that box and exported as a PDF, you should be you should be all set. So um, thank you all so much. That is the end of the presentation for today. Let me uh, go back to my presentation here. Move along. I did want to mention really quickly that there is also um, Kathy Marks, uh, who uh, is one of the uh, the the planners of uh, of the Global Accessibility Awareness Day today. Um, you all may know her. She is fantastic. She works with uh, UTO, and she actually does a accessibility access clinic, um, one to five p.m. by appointment uh, via Zoom. If you haven't, uh, so so she will sit with you. She will help. Uh, you know, if you have questions about web, web accessibility or about accessible documents, accessible PDFs, um, she's available. So I just always like to shout out that uh, that service because it's it's a fantastic service that she provides. There's also a uh, an accessibility Slack channel, uh, pound sign accessibility. Um, so that's another. Uh, Kathy posts the accessibility uh, clinic information there. And it's also a great place if you have questions about accessibility to, you know, to post and kind of crowdsource ideas or crowdsource questions. So that's also a great resource if you have questions about accessibility. So the, that being said, that that's the end of the presentation, or that's all I have prepared for today. Uh, today. Does anybody have any questions about uh, anything that I covered, or just um, any uh, examples from your your courses or anything like that that you would like uh, some some information on? I know that's it's a, it's a lot to cover in one in one session, and I just uh, again um, would never expect you know to obviously uh, remember every single every single setting. I think that's why the accessibility checker is so helpful. But hopefully, just by seeing this, it will be a, maybe a little bit less uh, intimidating in the future. <laughs> um, we will be talking, um, I'm uh, presenting with Adero on uh, creating accessible PDFs. So we'll, we'll touch a little bit on uh, Microsoft Word, um, but uh, you know, about some of the things that I talked about, we're gonna talk about um, alt text and some of the other um, sort of like principles for like writing good, writing uh, accessible material. Um, and then we'll be going really in depth into, into uh, Adobe Acrobat Pro and showing you how to, some of the accessibility features within that as well, so. <laughs> So thanks everyone. Um, that's that's all again. All I have prepared. Um, so if, if you want to take a few extra minutes and add to your break, please feel free. But um, otherwise, I'll I'll hang out for for questions.